Now, we're delighted to welcome into the studio live this morning Mr Nigel Farage from Reform UK, and he's hit back at Robert Jenderick and James Cleverley from the Conservatives who've um, hit at him, they've taken aim at him, and his party, Reform UK, claiming they want to make the party redundant. What do I mean? They, they want to make the party They want redundant. to make reform redundant. Make yeah, not Tories. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what do you make of that? Yeah, and he wants me to retire. Jenrick says we want Farrar to retire. That's ageist. Well, there's not a cat shards <laughs> in hell of that, let me assure you. Um, they're delusional. They're delusional. They think, let's get another leader, which, by the way, would be the, would be the sixth leader since 2016. Let's get a new leader come out with some different policies and somehow the public will all say, ah, oh, aren't they wonderful? We're going to come back to them. And what they don't understand is it's rather like a relationship. You know, if you keep letting the other side down, in the end, the relationship's broken. And we've had manifesto promises in 2010, 2015, 2017, 2019, all of which have been broken and there's now a big swathe of 2019 yes. Conservative voters who actually despise them who feel yeah. really betrayed by them. But there's a lot of people who despise you, right? <laughs> well, that's but, true. But, but, <laughs> you ask them why they despise you, and they'll say, because he's a racist. Mm. You'll ask him, what has he said that is racist, and then you hit trouble, because they can't really no. define it. No, no. what's he said? You know, I've often said to people, you know, what have I said? What have I said? And they, yeah, they can't put the yeah. finger on it. You know, think about politics, of course. There will always be people that don't like you, and that's fine. But unlike Mr Jenrick and all the others, I've been utterly consistent mm. for year after year in the principles and the things that I believe in. And, you know, they genuinely think that reform voters are coming back to the Conservatives, and they're not. And something really quite big, I think, is going on out there. Um, I'm not doing any deals with the Conservatives. I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them. Uh, their brand is broken for many years to come. And remember, think back to when... William Hague became the opposition leader to Tony Blair. You know, no one listened to what the Tories had to say for years, and we're back in that same kind of situation. They've made themselves irrelevant, trust has gone, uh, and so my message to them is, uh, sorry guys, but um, reform is here to stay. And interestingly, we're, not, we're now not even thinking about Conservative voters, we're thinking more about Labour voters. OK, that is interesting. But I just want to stay with the Conservative yeah. candidates to start with, because yeah. I think Jenrick probably is the closest to aping many of your policies. Talking well, about reversing VAT on school fees, talking mm. about getting rid of the ECHR, for mm. example. Mm. Um, but, you know, is he a threat to you? I mean, he wants to make well, you redundant, but he could well, well persuade well, some of those well, who are traditional Conservative voters on those two policies alone, could I mean, he? this is Robert Remainer Jenrick. Or People better, can change their mind. better known as Robert Generic, because he'd stood for precisely nothing for years, who suddenly has discovered this new inner core. Now, it may be genuine, uh, but when people have overnight political conversions, I'm always slightly suspicious. And let's say he does win on a policy of leaving the ECHR, yeah. his parliamentary party will never, ever support that. Mm -hmm. And that's their other problem. You know, one of the reasons the brand is broken is they've spent the last five years fighting with each other. Mm -hmm rather than standing up and fighting with things in the country that matters. So, no, they're split, they're divided, their brand is ruined. What uh, you will enjoy being in, you know, you've got five MPs in Parliament at the moment, you're a long way from power, I know you've got mm. ambitions of possibly being Prime Minister mm. in the future, is that you don't have to um, fulfil any of your policies, something that I think Starmer's realising now is very, very difficult. With this idea of walking away from the ECHR, I want mm. to ask you about this, because, as we said, Robert Jenrick's aping this suggestion. You've got people like Robert, uh, Robert Buckland of yeah. the party saying, this is making the party look weird, this isn't workable. If we walked mm. away from the ECHR, we would lose the right to privacy, homosexuality protections no, no, no. Th that was no, no, decriminalised no, no. in Northern no, Ireland. No, no. Phone hacking was made illegal. <laughs> and employers could no longer read employees' I'm sorry. emails without consent. No, come on, Let come me just on. finish the point. Come These on. are the benefits of the ECHR. No, if we no, walked no. away, would we not lose no, those as well? We have, we've had something called Magna Carta. It's been knocking around for 800 years. It was the essential blueprint for individual liberty. It stopped the state chucking you in jail without charge. It gave us the most extraordinary rights. I mean, America, you know, when America was founded, they thought, well, look at what the Brits have done. Well, the Magna we, Carta didn't we stop don't people need, being sent to jail in we, Northern Ireland, but the ECHR did. We don't don't. need a political court based in Strasbourg to tell us anything about liberty and freedom. And our system may not be perfect, but it's pretty much the best one any country in the world has ever invented. OK. What about... Um, I want to ask you about your professionalising of the party, because you've mm. reached... Uh, there was some criticism that this was 
founded as a company rather than as a political party. Mm. I know that you're changing that. You're stepping mm. away from mm. being a majority stakeholder. You've got rid of some of your key people. When I think of you, I think of Gawain Towler. People might recognise him as he looks like a member of the cast from Peaky Blinders, always <laughs> sort of behind you. At these, there's a picture of him there. He's been ousted now. Ben Habib, a regular on this programme, was a co-deputy um, of the party, also out. So you've been quite brutal in professionalising you know, it. When a small company becomes a big company, um, very often, some of the most loyal people who've been there from the start in a small party don't quite fit the mould of, of what you're changing into. And so, yeah, it's unfortunate. What didn't work about Gawain? Well, personalities uh, fit certain circumstances, but, but maybe not where we're trying to go. And I've got... No, I, I mean, he's worked with me for 20 years, so I wouldn't have a single bad word to say mm. about him, and he's a friend, and he will remain one. We are trying to professionalise the party. We think the political opportunity ahead of us is enormous. What we can't afford to have are candidates that say completely outrageous things. I, mean, I believe in free speech, but completely outrageous things. Um, and I've got to make sure we vetted people properly. I've got to make sure we have a grassroots structure built around the country. And I'm trying to do what would normally take 10 years in six months, yeah. between now and the county council elections mm -hmm. next year. So, yeah, we have a lot on our plate. Um, have we become a more ruthless organisation since I brought Zia Youssef in as chairman? Yes, we have. But we have a very, very clear ambition of where we want to be. And in my past life mm. with UKIP, that was about a cause, one individual cause. This is now much broader. This, yeah. is, this is about the country, the way in which we're governed, uh, and we think we can find no one, people... No one can point the finger at you and say you're a one-party... Uh, well, a one-party issue yeah. for you um, there. But who is it, Nigel, who's voting for you? Who do you appeal to? Who are you looking to woo? I just think good, ordinary, decent folk, uh, regardless of whether they're centre-right, centre-left, uh, regardless of class or geography, people, Eamon, who are concerned that the values upon which our country, our communities, our society were built on are under attack, are under threat, uh, a feeling that we're heading in the wrong direction, uh, a feeling that uh, the population explosion, I mean, 10 million since Mr Blair came to power, frankly, has devalued the quality of life of almost everybody. And I think what they want um, is, 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 is the kind of leadership that is unafraid the kind of leadership that, that, that doesn't go woke and doesn't say, we've got to pander to this minority or that minority. We're very clear. You know, we, we couldn't care less what sexuality you are. We couldn't care less what colour you are. We've got to start... This idea that we put people into different boxes is actually divisive for the country. It's not bringing people together. Yeah. And I think we've got the courage to say what the silent majority actually think. Mm. We want to get back the values based on family, community and country mm. that, that make us what we are. I want to ask you about Keir Starmer heading to Brussels today, a place you know very yeah. well. He wants to create what he calls a more mature... He wants back in the European Union. <laughs> well, I'm just asking whether or not you share his views that we need a mature uh, relationship with the European Union, that perhaps it needs a reset. And he's under huge mm. pressure, particularly around this deal on youth mobility. You uh, claim to be attracting younger viewers, uh, younger voters. Yeah. You know, how will you square that with them if they're thinking about know, voting reform? A lot of them wish they could continue their do you know, do you know, studies abroad. How many youngsters go on gap years to Frankfurt? Hardly any. Well, it's not they about go on because it's part of their degrees. No, 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 no. But they go and climb the Andes or they go out to the Far East. The world's changed. This idea that my mum and dad had, but, that Europe was all terribly exciting no, but, 50 years but, ago, but it's they gone. They should be able to go there, surely, and do that. I mean, why... You know why do you know, do you know what? Not fussed about it. Do you know what? I honestly think it's a pretty marginal issue. I think the real problem is that the Conservative Party didn't take us far enough away from membership of the European Union, which makes it very easy for Keir Starmer just to ape every new piece of European law. And we'll finish up at the end of a Starmer government. It will be Brino. It will be Brexit in name only. Come the next election, who is your main opposition? Who is your enemy? Is it the Conservative Party? Or is it the sitting government? No, it's Labour. There's no question about it. It is Labour and it is those traditional working-class seats in South Wales, in the Midlands, in the north of England, uh, in many cases uh, seats that have been Labour since the end of the First World War, uh, where their communities, those old Labour voting communities, are so far detached from the North London elite mm -hmm. that Would the Labour Party's become. Would you the Winterfuel Alliance? I wouldn't, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why because we are paying the most expensive energy bills in the world. 
I mean, can you believe our electricity prices are 75% higher than America's, 33% higher than France's, and the more we, and it's a slightly separate issue, but the more we go down the net zero route, the more wind turbines we build, the higher people's bills become. Yeah. Yeah. And Ed Miliband's plan for us to head you know, towards being carbon neutral with electricity generation, it means 10 years of rising prices. So for that reason, above all, I would not have done um, it. There was a lot, a lot of praise yesterday for the, the closing of our last um, coal-fired power station. Uh, and I actually was looking at it and thinking, is this all too soon? Why are people rejoicing <laughs> about this? Yeah. What is the benefit here? Yeah. The end of coal, Boris Johnson told us. Do you know, this year, in 2024, across the planet, we're going to burn 8 billion tonnes of coal. I'll say that again. 8 from, from billion tonnes. Yeah. yeah, 8 billion tonnes. Mm -hmm. In 2024, the world will burn more coal than it's ever burned in its entirety of its history. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we closed down a coal-fired power station, which is a very useful backup if renewables don't produce the goods. We have seen the port Port Talbot, primary steelworks close, our second to last primary steelworks close. Harlan and Wolf, of course, in very, very big trouble in, in a part of the world that you know very well. Um, the biggest refinery in the UK, Grangemouth, closing down. And the primary reason for this deindustrialization is our energy prices are too high. And I think both parties are completely out of touch with the public on this. Do we want to save the planet? Yes. But you know what? We can't do it if the others go on burning um, lots of cars. Farage, I could talk to you about so many things, <laughs> and I want to keep going, but I have to ask you, yeah. are you going to the States for the election, and is is Trump toast? I'll be there on, on the night of November the 5th. But yes. are you going to be involved in some campaigning? No, I, because I've become an MP. You can't do that. So, so my priorities have had to shift and change for obvious reasons. I've got a constituency to represent in Clacton, etc. Um, so that is now my priority. I spoke to Trump on the phone uh, two weeks ago. He, I mean, clearly... You know, however tough he may look in public, to have two near assassination attempts in the space of a few weeks, it has to affect somebody. Yeah. I still think he's going to win, but boy, it's going to be tight. And if he doesn't win, will he concede? If he doesn't win, I would guess that's the end of Donald in politics. He's nearly 80. Okay. All right. Nigel.